Good evening. I think we're on a roll. This is the second time we've had foul weather outside and a given respite to you all for that. So welcome to the Central Library. So in addition to our books, we also give you warm places to sit. I'm David McKay. For those who don't know me, I'm the director of the Boston Public Library Foundation. And it's our um, privilege to support uh, the library in a variety of ways. For We uh, make grants for programs for children and uh, to seniors, exhibitions, lectures such as the one tonight, and all in the name of advancing learning, which is the library's mission. So tonight, we're fortunate enough to culminate this series of the Lowell Lecture Series with an inter a member of the integral uh, part of the family, excuse me, of the history and the development of one of Boston's most cherished sports temples, Fenway Park. Fenway and the Red Sox are not strangers to the Boston Public Library community. For the past 17 years, BPL Foundation and the Red Sox Foundation have been key sponsors of a great summer reading program um, for children and teens known as Read Your Way to Fenway. And over the last several years, 23,000 children and their parents have been able to go to Fenway Park. And each year, some of them are lucky enough to go down onto the field. This year, the students, of uh, the uh, participants, will have an opportunity to see the Red Sox versus that team in New York. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what the foundation does, please let me know or go on our website at www.bplf.com. The library and the foundation are grateful to the Lowell Institute, who has been continuously sponsoring this um, program for a number of years. And they were founded in 1836 as an institute to provide lecture series and ideas free of charge, which fits perfectly with our motto, free to all. So I'm pleased to see that you're here taking advantage of this great series, and I think it's a real gift to the intellectual curiosity of Bostonians. This year's Lowell Lecture Series Common Ground celebrates public spaces, their creators, chroniclers, and communities of users. This series is part of a larger initiative at the library called Building Boston, which includes the lectures and includes expansive offering of programs that are taking place throughout the library system and five impressive exhibitions that were held here in the library. Before I introduce the speaker, I'm supposed to remind you, if you would be so kind, to please turn off all those things that make noise. Thank you. Janet Marie Smith served as the Senior Vice President of Planning and Development for the Boston Red Sox during its redevelopment from 2002 to 2009. During that time, she oversaw the preservation of our historic Fenway Park, and through her work, the nexus of the Red Sox Nation is now listed on the Registry of Historic Places. Last year, the uh, Boston baseball writers honored Smith with a special achievement award for her work at Fenway Park. Ms. Smith is, now, uh, is not new to the baseball world, nor was she new to it when she came here uh, for the Red Sox. Prior to this, she was at, in Baltimore um, during the design and construction of the Camden Yards. She has been swept away out to warm and cozy Los Angeles, where she is the senior vice president for um, planning and development there, as the Dodgers uh, Stadium receives upgrades and enhancements. So how do you get a cool job like this? Well, you get to start by getting a bachelor's degree from Mississippi State University and get a master's degree in urban planning from the City College of New York, all mixed with a healthy dose of talent. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Janet Marie Smith. Very much for that wonderful introduction. I think uh, the fact that we're focusing on baseball tonight is meant to be an introduction to warm weather. So I, uh, I congratulate all of you for braving um, the cold. I'm honored um, that you you came out. I told uh, my my husband and son, as we walked over, that I got used to 40 degrees being cold in L.A. very quickly uh, and don't miss the snow at all, I must say. Uh, I, I really was so honored to get this call uh, from the Boston Public Library to speak to you this evening, um, not only because of 
uh, others who have um, shared this podium and what a, a stellar group it is. But it was such a, a wonderful reflection for me on ballparks, on uh, the things that I've been involved in, and on just the evolution of design of one of the most wonderful communal things, I think, in our environment. Uh, one of the things that I have enjoyed about sports is that it does cut across all kinds of economic, social, um, and, uh, and uh, educational lines, and it gives us all something in common to talk about. So like uh, the Boston Commons and the Boston Public Library, I think Fenway in many respects is very much a mixing ground. Uh, so in telling the story of ballparks, um, I am going to start and end with Fenway Park, and not just because I'm here in Boston, it really is the way that I think about ballparks and their evolution. Uh, one of the th wonderful things about baseball and what drew me as an architect and urban planner to that sport and to really study it is that um, of all the sports, baseball is most interwoven with our city and with our, our civic spirit of cities. Um, whether you were in um, a city like Boston where you are tucked into the uh, neighborhoods of Fenway or uh, almost any other ballpark of the early 1900s, uh, the park itself reflected the city you were in. So Fenway Park sits over at the edge of uh, the Back Bay, and of course its playing field and uh, architecture both are a reflection of this very tight site that it's on. Uh, baseball is the only sport, I guess maybe other than golf, that doesn't have any set field dimensions. And so uh, the, des the design of uh, the park was very much a reflection of the geographic limitations of the block it was on. And so this was born the quirky dimensions uh, that we've known and loved at, at Fenway Park since 1912. Wrigley Field in Chicago is another wonderful example of a park of this era. Uh, Wrigley, Wrigley was built in 1914. Uh, the friendly confines of Wrigley Field has been known forever, and we all know it because of its ivy-covered walls and center field bleachers. Um, but it's a, a, from a civic perspective, I think one of the things that's most interesting about it is um, the neighborhood itself and how these row tops um, have always been very much a part of the, the Cubs and their culture, so much so that today, the Cubs own pieces of these rooftops and claim a portion of the revenue as if people were walking through the gates. Forbes Field in Pittsburgh um, and its tight um, site, the architecture that could have uh, just as much been a, a library or um, other kind of civic building, uh, the stands very close to the foul lines, a very intimate part of the seating bowl. Um, same characteristics were found in Philadelphia at Scheib Park, uh, later known as Connie Mack, uh, Crosley Field in Cincinnati, uh, and of course um, the recently uh, lost but much loved Tiger Stadium in Detroit where the uh, left field um, deck literally overhung the playing field. Maybe the most beloved of the parks of this era uh, was Ebbets Field, and Ebbets Field um, was home to the Brooklyn Dodgers and like Fenway was tucked very uh, tightly into its neighborhood uh, with only a dimension of 297 down the right field line and this quirky scoreboard that's set there. Not a single parking spot that belonged uh, to the Dodgers. Um, and all these seats, um, all 32,000 of them, that sat um, very snugly inside the city block. Um, but in fact, it was um, this tight site that catapulted uh, the Dodgers to Los Angeles. Um, for those who are interested in city planning, maybe more than, art, uh, than baseball, or at least equally as interested in it, uh, the Dodgers is an interesting study in American city building. Um, after a decade of Walter O'Malley, the owner of the Dodgers, um, pleading with the uh, city of New York to help him acquire a piece of land to build a new Dodger stadium, witnessing, as he did in the late 40s, that the car was here to stay and that he needed to be able to provide uh, parking. Um, Robert Moses, who was then the head of the Parks Department in uh, New York, refused to help him in this sort of famously worded letter that he did not find it in the public interest uh, to assist Mr. O'Malley or anyone else with their private sports franchise. 
And so Walter O'Malley uh, famously packed up and left and went to um, Los Angeles, where they did have plenty of parking, um, and where the, the city um, wooed him with great interest, offering up the 300 acres of Chavez Ravine that had been cleared almost a decade earlier to make way for a federal housing project that never happened. Um, but the park itself was privately funded, even though he got in Los Angeles what he had hoped to get in New York, and that was assistance with the acquisition of the land. So um, in Dodger Stadium in 1962, um, a ballpark opened that had 16,000 cars compared to the none in Brooklyn, and maybe equally as important in terms of trend setting for sports, look at this little chart that I found in um, Mr. O'Malley's archives that shows the difference in the seats. Um, at Ebbets Field and Dodger Stadium. Uh, the number of box seats, as they were called, the more premium seats in the park, um, went from uh, just a little over 4,000 uh, to almost half of Dodger Stadium, being between the foul lines and located low and close to the playing field. So the Dodgers went from a 32,000-seat park to a 56,000-seat park, but maybe more importantly in terms of uh, the offerings to their fans, uh, they were able to offer um, literally uh, more than quadruple the number of, quote, box seats. For those of you who um, are, are, in, are envious, there's good reason. They are a fabulous way to watch baseball. So Dodger Stadium and, uh, now ranks as the third oldest park in the major leagues behind uh, Fenway 1912, Wrigley 1914, and then there is no other major league park. Um, that survives as a major league park um, until the 1962 Dodger Stadium. Um, it's very, its architecture is very much born of the 50s, though it opened in 62 with these pastel colors and uh, the sort of wonderful uh, colloquial phrases about the, be the beauty of Southern California, uh, the San Gabriel Mountains off in the distance, uh, and the celebration of what it was like to be able to drive your car to Dodger Stadium. But it set off a trend in baseball that wasn't necessarily healthy, and suddenly everyone wanted what the Dodgers had, which was more than 50,000 seats, lots of parking, lots of land to maneuver around. Ironically, in 1965, uh, the, the Astrodome in Texas opened with almost the identical building that Walter O'Malley and, um, had, had hoped to have in Brooklyn when he'd hired Buckminster Fuller to design this dome. Um, I love the, this is actually my first Major League Baseball game was at the Astrodome, and I distinctly remember being there uh, when the roof was um, sunlight coming through. They had natural grass in there, as you can see in this photo, and thus was born the term AstroTurf because grass wouldn't grow inside even when you had um, sun in there, and they eventually painted out the roof so that the outfielder wouldn't lose the ball against the dome and uh, then had to invent something to take the place of that natural grass. Um, but maybe um, more importantly uh, than the architecture, uh, the important thing that happened in sports was that suddenly cities got on the bandwagon. If New York wasn't willing to help um, to use their, their public um, uh, abilities to acquire land, to issue bonds, to help the Dodgers, uh, certainly the fact that the Dodgers um, uh, let their protests be known loud and clear by moving to the other coast, every city in America then bent over backwards to find a way to justify the public investment in a new stadium in order to keep their team. And thus was born um, the era of multi-purpose ballparks those that um, were designed for both uh, baseball and football, uh, but really, um, as we came to learn very quickly, never worked for either. Three River Stadium in Pittsburgh, Riverfront in Cincinnati, Atlanta Fulton County um, Stadium in Atlanta. Um, all of these parks, as you can see from this sort of head-on view, um, they were designed uh, to sort of split the difference in what uh, the capacity that baseball needed, which was more, a more intimate 40 to 50,000, and what football wanted, which was a much larger 60 to 70,000. But maybe worse, um, it put everyone as far away as it could be, no matter what sport it was. So in baseball, uh, those who wanted to sit between the foul lines were seated um, 
pushed pretty far back from the foul territory, and those who wanted to be on the 50-yard line uh, for football fared no better. And sort of worse in terms of the personality, um, I think uh, the public came to agree after a generation that these parks simply had no charm, that you really didn't know where you were or not for the signs. Um, so Kansas City set about to change that in 1970s. Um, Kansas City acquired some land uh, just outside the city uh, and built uh, the first baseball-only park uh, and almost um, since the Dodgers had opened, um, sort of breaking the trend of this multi-purpose stadium and building both a football and a baseball park. Um, in, the, in the storytelling of ballparks, Kansas City doesn't get a lot of play um, and I think that's somewhat unfortunate because this was such a bold move, particularly for a city that size, to build not one but two parks uh, for their sports. Um, and uh, it, it did um, cause everyone else to sort of start to think about doing the same. In Chicago, the White Sox um, wanted to follow that model and build a baseball-only park to replace Comiskey, um, and uh, they were looking to move literally next door. Uh, Comiskey was uh, built in 19, it opened in 1991, and it was, on, it was under construction uh, when I had the chance to work for Larry Lucchino in Baltimore on what we now know as Camden Yards. But this photograph that um, I took myself, and thus it's not a terribly great one, <laughs> but uh, it kind of tells the story of the difference in old Comiskey and its scale and intimacy in new Comiskey. And while their rhetoric was that they were they were constructing a new Comiskey next door, it was simply going it was going to have many of the same features, many of the same qualities um, of architecture on the exterior. They were going to take their exploding scoreboard and reinvent it next door. You can see from this photograph that the scale of it was simply so different that it really uh, had no resemblance at all to old Comiskey and the intimacy uh, that surrounded that. So, um, you know, maybe in some ways uh, we were lucky in Baltimore to have that uh, precede us so that we had a chance to study and learn from uh, that exploration. In my view, um, again, uh, maybe more from a city planning perspective than a baseball perspective, uh, but uh, I would say that the stars really aligned in Baltimore when the state of Maryland decided to follow the Kansas City model and after the Colts left uh, for Indianapolis, uh, and they realized they were going to have to build a new park in order to keep the Orioles. They chose to build not only uh, two different stadiums, but they chose an urban site and one that um, was destined to be a part of downtown Baltimore. Um, now, here in Boston, um, Baltimore is probably not high on your radar screen, but Baltimore has been looking at Boston and it's for its city planning tips uh, since the 70s now. And so by the time we built Camden Yards, Baltimore had... Uh, had reinvented the Inner Harbor, and Jim Rouse had been brought in to do something that was akin to Fanville Hall. The aquarium had been constructed um, very much on the model of the one here in Boston. Convention Center had been moved downtown and um, more than doubled in size. And so the uh, governor, William Donald Schaefer, who was the mayor when the uh, Colts left for Indianapolis, just simply said, well, I'm not going to have another team leave on my watch, but I'm also not going to allow the team to move outside of downtown. His thesis was that we had already, as a community, invested in light rail, invested in public transit, invested in uh, highways to bring in 200,000 people a year into, uh, excuse me, a day into downtown Baltimore. And so why not allow that same infrastructure to do double duty the 81 times a year, usually evenings and weekends, when baseball uh, was playing. Um, I, I got there just on the tail end of all these studies that these economists did to try and demonstrate where the best site could be. And um, Governor Schaefer sort of famously said when they came in with these stacks and stacks of three ring binders that he didn't need any study to tell him that downtown was the place to be. Um, but since the Orioles were being led at that time by Larry Lucchino, who's now, of course, president of the Red Sox here in Boston, and Larry's dream was to have an old-fashioned ballpark. This site really lent credence uh, to that notion. 
Uh, so credit the good work of HOK and their willingness to think differently about uh, ballparks, which was a huge risk for them uh, at the time, and to look at designing Camden Yards in a way that it, so it really nestled in neatly uh, with Baltimore's row houses next door. Uh, this team uh, undertook the bold move of keeping rather than tearing down the 1,000-foot-long, 50-foot-wide warehouse that was on the property. Many had surmised that the ballpark would have more flexibility and uh, be a better park if the warehouse were torn down. But the Orioles' view of it was that what made the old parks like Ebbets, Fenway, Wrigley interesting is that they were in a tight urban environment and they did make good use, uh, as you saw at Wrigley, of the surrounding buildings and that those buildings were very much engaged in, in baseball. So the warehouse was kept and it gave us a rationale um, for doing a lot of standing room area to do a lot of things that uh, harken back to the uh, old old parks of um, standing room only. We moved things into the warehouse that ranged from our ushers changing rooms to the central kitchen to the Orioles offices. Um, and maybe the nicest thing about the warehouse is it gave us an excuse to somewhat mimic uh, Yawkey Way here in Boston uh, with Baltimore's own Utah Street, the street that runs parallel uh, to the warehouse and on game days uh, turnstiles are set up at either end of the street and it's a part of the the ballpark concourse and on non-game times they go away and it's part of the inner harbor um, walking areas through downtown. I'm sort of celebrating baseball throughout with the Orioles interest in not having um, its history displayed as objects under glass but littering the public environment with things that fans would resonate with that would give you a sense of the team history and a reason uh, to engage in the sport whether there was a game or not and those things range from retired numbers to um, marking baseballs that were hit out of the park uh, with a bronze plaque uh, to oversized bobbleheads, uh, to more recently bronze sculptures, this one dedicated to Frank Robinson, one of the six uh, players whose numbers have been retired uh, for, for the Orioles. Um, so uh, that worked out uh, well for Baltimore, but maybe it worked out well for baseball too, because in the uh, 20 years since, um, 16 teams have built new parks, and 14 of those have been in the heart of their urban communities. So whereas in the, the 60s and 70s, um, sports were used as a rationale for clearing hundreds of acres of downtown and building new, uh, almost as an urban renewal exercise, by the 90s, uh, baseball parks in particular uh, were being used as a way of helping downtowns more from their original role as a center of finance uh, to their uh, more current role of being uh, sort of a, call it what you like, a live, work, uh, play environment, more of an entertainment destination. And you see that example uh, played out in Denver and Coors Field, uh, which is part of the Lodo development in uh, lower downtown Denver. Um, in Atlanta, Turner Field, where they made good use of the Olympic Stadium that was built for the 1996 Olympics, building it, and while it was on paper, turning it into a baseball park so that it would be home to the Braves post-Olympics. Um, and um, AT&T Park, which really jump-started the development um, of this portion of the Bay Area um, in San Francisco. And like Camden Yards, is very much a part of its environment. And maybe my favorite uh, non-Baltimore project uh, it, uh, is uh, Pittsburgh's PNC Park, uh, which is very much a part of its downtown and the development that has led to the creation of the Andy Warhol Museum and uh, many restaurants opening in this section of Pittsburgh. Um, one of the other things that is notable about this trend that, um, that we see most acutely in parks like San Diego, um, which Larry Lucchino was uh, also involved with, with Sam Kennedy and others who are here in Boston working for the Red Sox now, was this focus on um, not only building uh, downtown um, and saving old buildings, as you see in the Western Metal Building, but by the time that this park opened in 2002, the trend in baseball was just getting smaller and smaller. San Diego opened uh, with just over 40,000 seats and the most recent ballpark to open uh, the Target Field for the Twins in Minneapolis uh, has less than 40,000 seats. And I mention that as I return to Boston with some commentary about um, our favorite beloved Fenway Park. 
Um, in many ways, uh, Fenway Park managed to survive the chopping block for a whole host of reasons, uh, not the least of which was that Boston as a city and Massachusetts as a state weren't in the business of helping the Red Sox any more than uh, the city of New York was uh, willing to help uh, Walter O'Malley back in uh, the 50s. Uh, and it was very hard for the team, even though they wanted a new park, to find any rationale um, to economically to build something as big as what their brethren in baseball were building in the 90s when the aim was 50,000 seats. But by the time uh, that I had a chance to come and work on Fenway Park when uh, Tom Werner, John Henry, and Larry Lucchino bought the club, uh, the trend in baseball, as I said, was shrinking. So suddenly Fenway Park's 33,000 seats didn't seem nearly as small when the aim was 40,000 as when the aim had been 50,000. And uh, we'd all like to look like geniuses and heroes for having saved Fenway, but I think it's important to note that the trend was heading in a direction that made um, the kind of creative thinking uh, that Charles Steinberg and Mike D and Sam Kennedy and others brought to this um, project a real, a, a, something that could, could be thought of in the context of that original structure. Um, so we set about um, analyzing the Fenway Park that, um, that we had inherited um, and looking at it uh, first not just as a, as a home for baseball, but first how it set into uh, the, the Fens, how it set into its neighborhood, what its role was and how fans would react to it. We realized having worked on other, other projects what a difference there was in scale and not just counting seats. You know, I think that was one of uh, the Achilles heel of some of the previous analyses of Fenway was that uh, if you looked at the seats, yep, Fenway Park's 33, uh, 34,000 seats was small, but more importantly, the square footage was small. We only had 750,000 square feet, whereas most ballparks had well over a million square feet. So it wasn't just the seats that were suffering, it was all the support areas. We did a lot of study, uh, not only by talking with fans um, and trying to get in the heads of those who'd used the park for generations. We also had the benefit of the Boston Public Library, and it's nice to be here to thank them tonight for their role in this. Um, and looking uh, through their archives, we really got a good feel of how fans had used the park over the decades. This is one of my favorite photos of Yawkey Way. Um, and as you can see, Yawkey Way has always been the front door of Fenway and has always been the place where fans crowded um, until the strains of the national anthem and then rushed through the gates. So in a little bit of a art imitating life and life imitating art moment, uh, we went to uh, Mayor Menino and Commissioner Kazaza at City Hall, um, and with the help of the BRA, we asked for permission to move the turnstiles out from the face of Fenway Park onto Yawkey Way so that we could essentially append that street that, as you saw in that photo a moment ago, had long been a part of Fenway to the ballpark itself. Um, we also had the advantage of a neighborhood that really wanted to keep this historic park. And that community uh, could not have been better to work with. They were very frank with us in their commentary that they were not for privatizing a public street, but if that was the key to saving Fenway Park, they were willing to bend to adjust to give it a trial run. It did make a huge difference for us. It added square footage to the park. It allowed us to put up more turnstiles. It allowed us to have more points of sale. It allowed us to free up areas so that we could build new restrooms. Um, and it was an instant hit and gave us the ability to take things that had been done in the bowels of the park, like our pre- and post-game show, and put them out where fans could really be a part of it. Uh, so um, nothing uh, sort of makes one want to go after um, uh, similar projects more than having one as well received as Yonke Way was by both our na the neighborhood and our fans. And so we uh, went to the opposite end of the park and took a look at what was going on out there. Um, this is a good slide for me to make one of my favorite points, that Fenway Park itself um, is actually... Um, comprised of three different buildings um, that the Red Sox had acquired over the years. The Geno building, which sits up in the top left-hand corner, uh, and then the, um, the, the, so the building we call the laundry building. It's really a, a garage that was built just after Fenway opened that sits um, to the right in the, behind the bleachers. And you can see this blue elliptical circle outlines um, the area underneath the bleachers and in this uh, laundry building 
uh, that looked at the time like this. It was literally an alley uh, with an easement that separated the two buildings. Uh, there was a, an open-air dumpster, media trucks, and the public didn't have access to this. So we, we went back knocking on the door of um, Mayor Menino's office, and we asked if we could uh, meet with uh, the Zoning uh, Board of Appeals and talk to them about literally erasing this easement and getting permission to combine these buildings uh, so that we could create what's uh, come to be known as the big concourse at Fenway. Again, giving us much needed space to add restrooms, add concessions, uh, and to really make this part of the park a, a, a seismic change from what it had been uh, its first 70 years of existence uh, when fans could only be underneath the bleachers and in the caged area um, that was fenced in. I've told this story so many times that probably there's some of you in the audience who've heard it, so forgive me, but I, um, one of the ways that I try to think about my buildings is to get in the head of those people who are using it uh, most frequently, and particularly in the case of Fenway, you really uh, wanted to understand uh, from, from the perspective of fans what they thought about the work. So the series, when we opened up the big concourse, for the first time, it wasn't an opening day project. It was one that we opened up in May. Um, and I went out there to listen to what fans had to say as they came in, expecting to hear uh, lots of oohs and ahs. My favorite comment was from a guy who walked through there with his buddy who said, do you know they painted this whole place since I was here last? So <laughs> <laughs> there we were, $8 million in, with about 300 new restroom fixtures and about 12 new concession stands and added 50 feet to the concourse, and he was celebrating the paint. Um, I did take it as a compliment, though, because we wanted Fenway to look like Fenway. We didn't want it to seem as though uh, we had done any radical surgery on it. Uh, and to that, I give huge credit to our architectural firm, De Agostino, Izzo, and Quirk, uh, who worked with us on these projects, uh, and along with the structural engineer, McNamara Salvia, really made sure that everything we did um, was deeply rooted in these kinds of images. So I've got lots of these photographs from the Boston Public Library um, that we really came to love, but we studied these, and while everyone else was uh, probably comes here and looks at them from a ba through a baseball lens, we were looking at the pipe railing, we were looking at the netting, uh, we were looking uh, in this image at the seats and the wall and how all that came together. Uh, we were curious about the signage that had been at Fenway over the years, not just inside the park, but on the horizon outside the park. Uh, all, some of these player photos, um, I kept not because I was focused on their form or who they were, but because of the scoreboard in the background, because of the way that um, you could see the seats coming together, you could understand Fenway and its gaps and its elephant door and all of its nuances. Um, and these kinds of things gave us a lot of uh, confidence that there were ways that we could um, make changes to Fenway Park but keep this inherent characteristic uh, so that it would be a park that could be transformed into something uh, that would work for 2000, um, for the 2000s and on, uh, just as it had through the um, 1900s. The Green Monster looked like this when we inherited it, and it had long been discussed as an uh, opportunity to do something creative. People had proposed tearing it down and putting up a glass wall and taking over Lansdowne Street to put stacked suites. They'd suggested putting a big seating section there. Um, and after a lot of study, uh, we chose to put um, sort of a simple seating section on top of the Green Monster. It was probably the boldest thing we ever did. And um, Larry Lucchino felt strongly about making it first. Um, he thought it would be a good litmus test to how the public would react to change at Fenway. Uh, but we didn't over, want to overdo a good thing. And while many um, criticized it at the time and said, why would you go to all that trouble for less than 500 seats when you could have made it 5,000 seats, we felt that the novelty wouldn't last if there were 5,000 seats, whereas if we gave it just a gentle touch, that we would have something that at the end of the day, it's, to, it's an outfield seat, and had we put too many of them there, their popularity would have worn off. But since you feel like you're sitting in the bowels of the netting that had been there for so many generations, uh, just go to eBay if you don't think their value has, has, has held, or StubHub, or whatever you do if you're in the secondary market. Um, 
So the same kind of attitude took us to the right field roof. We thought, golly, if this has been good enough for uh, photographers in the All-Star game over the years, it ought to be uh, good enough for us to treat it with our fan, for our fans. Uh, again, we studied the old photographs that we found here in the archives to think about how to do this in a way that we could preserve the character and charm. Um, for instance, we had many who suggested that we fill in the gap between uh, the, the bleachers and the right field grandstand, but if you look at all those Boston Public Library photos, it shows up as a distinctive architectural feature, so we kept it. and. Um, when we did the, um, the seats on top of the right field roof where the Budweiser sign is now, uh, we took a lot of care, again, like the Green Monster, to do just a few hundred seats so that they'd have a charm and a personality that wasn't like any other outfield seat. Um, this is another Boston Public Library uh, image, and you can see um, that we might uh, here where we were looking at how the seating sections had been added over the years to step down to the playing field, um, how those turns had been preserved. And so when we transformed the left field pavilion in 2007 uh, to this Coca-Cola uh, deck, it was with a lot of sensitivity toward the history. The biggest project that we did during the, um, during the years that I was working for the Red Sox was to take um, these uh, temporary seats on either side of the 600 Club, and indeed the 600 Club itself, um, and take the glass off of that, um, that area that Dan Shaughnessy once referred to as, a, as, as the aquarium at Fenway, um, and, uh, and to do something that really uh, allowed you to connect with baseball. You can imagine on surveys all kinds of people might have checked yes when asked if they would enjoy uh, being inside a heated air-conditioned area right behind home plate. It sounds good until you get in there and you realize you're totally disconnected from the sounds, the smells, and the game. Uh, but nonetheless, these kinds of things, had kept Fenway alive, and so the renovation we did, which was done to the National Park Service standards, and uh, which eventually um, uh, gave um, us an opportunity to put Fenway Park on the historic register, um, when it was transformed, um, we were able to add another, um, another 4,000 seats to the park, but using that same envelope of space, and, um, and DAIQ really worked hard to knit those seats in uh, so that we were able to create something that wasn't out of scale with the original uh, 1914, excuse me, 1912 and 1934 Fenway editions, um, but that gave us some of the um, kind of amenities that the newer parks had. And then I wanted to end on the things that um, I love the most, um, so this is the planner in me coming out again, but I really enjoyed taking areas uh, along Fenway Park uh, that had been closed for decades and opening them up so that fans had some sense of activity of the park and the park had life more than 81 times a year. Um, areas where uh, that had been closed off literally for decades uh, were turned into restaurants and retail uh, that would be alive um, throughout the season. And that was one of the most important things that we tried to do was to say uh, that as a neighborhood park that we had a responsibility not just to be shuttered and to be a, a dark hole when there wasn't baseball there, uh, but to be a part of the neighborhood life and the revitalization um, of these Back Bay neighborhoods. Um, so uh, with that, I'll close my um, remarks, um, and I would be delighted to take questions or comments from any of you. Yes, sir. Well, Dodger Stadium is undergoing a similar um, metamorphosis in many ways. We um, have, there were some things about Dodger Stadium that are 1962 in a good way, and there's some things that are 1962 in a not so good way. Um, and so this year we have taken our clubhouse and we are redoing that and adding batting cages underneath the seating bowl uh, for both the home team and the visiting team. Um, it's embarrassing for the Dodgers, who like to think of themselves as a marquee franchise, uh, to confess this, but we've had the visiting team using our batting cage and weight room now for decades. Major League Baseball requires that you give uh, both teams uh, similar facilities, and we wanted to get them out of our clubhouse, give our players um, a, a, the clubhouse we felt um, our payroll deserved. Um, and importantly for our fans, though, um, during the Fox and the McCourt era, 
uh, the uh, suites and the field box seats had been totally redone. No one had touched the pavilions in the outfield, the loge level, the reserve level, or the top deck um, since some concession stands were added in the 80s and the restrooms were still all 1962, which is to say they were not ADA compliant. So we're renovating every restroom um, and adding new concessions, team stores, um, and we've actually taken seats out on the back row of each level of Dodger Stadium to create wider concourses and grander views of the playing field. Um, certainly we've taken some tips from Fenway Park and so we invite you out when, you, when we play the Red Sox this spring and you can see which ones we, we exported to the West Coast. Yes? I'm not sure that Dodger Stadium will ever be knit into a neighborhood the same way that, um, that these East Coast parks are. And in some ways, um, I, I think the fact that so many teams have moved into urban settings, sitting there with those views of the San Gabriel Mountains really does set it apart. So I think there's some trepidation about messing with that. We certainly um, would like to do a better job of using that asset um, year round. And one of the things that we've been working on is uh, not only making it easier to get in and out of Dodger Stadium, but we're hosting motocross, the marathon uh, concerts, um, and doing things that take advantage of having that kind of open space in a dense urban environment. I mean, ironically, we are in a dense urban environment. We just don't have it budding right up to us. So it is an anomaly in that, that perspective. I, I can't see for the light, but I think there's a hand right there. So. They did, absolutely. Um, the, the players were a very uh, key group for us, although uh, every team's got a different culture. And I, I must say, from of the teams I've worked for, the Red Sox probably had the least, um, the least, or the shortest list, maybe that's the best way to say it. I mean, there were some things that were so um, miserably wrong with our clubhouse that you didn't need to ask the players to know. I mean, for instance, in 2002, we had the umpires coming through our clubhouse to theirs upstairs. Now, it didn't take a whole lot of research. You know, that, that wasn't a good thing. So one of the things we did early on was to move the umpires clubhouse down the hall um, uh, so that we could claim that space for the Red Sox. Uh, and uh, we built a new weight room, built new batting cages, um, put in a lounge, put in a kitchen. Nut nutrition is a big part of the way um, teams like to, to handle their players. So we had a, a lot of input from the baseball side um, that uh, affected the way we, we changed it. And some things about Fenway's clubhouse are unique. It's the only two-story clubhouse I know of, but you know we didn't have any place to grow except to take over space upstairs. Um, but these are athletes, you know, going up a set of stairs requires no more effort than walking down the hall when you have a 50,000 square foot clubhouse as most, um, most teams do. So uh, their bigger issue um, for us is really how we handle things on the playing field and not wanting our seats to grow down so much that it chewed into the foul territory or created uh, quirkier corners in an already quirky park. Uh, or that it crept down in a way that the batter's eye in the outfield would impact um, the hitters at the plate. You must be uh, pleased to be able to do off-season construction without winter protection. <laughs> <laughs> You're, You're congratulated on the concrete work at Fenway and Susie Cole. And uh, I've seen some photographs. I'd love to get a hold of during the construction. Globe had one. Ooh, this, is Erica here tonight? Can you answer that question? <laughs> Yeah, I think, the, I think the Red Sox and the Boston Globe actually have a wonderful collection of those photographs. 
Um, and you're right, that was the hardest part of Fenway was sort of dealing with the winter weather. Um, and even when we did things like when we, did, when we built the batting cages and we took out the seats in the lower bowl and went down to build the batting cages underneath them, um, you know, there were things that you'd find down there. The earth would be frozen and you couldn't dig and then there'd be foundations you didn't know about and then there would be a rotting ship down there and there was wood and you couldn't get through it. So, I mean, there were just some fascinating things about it that never quite... Uh, were interesting enough to stop construction for which we were grateful, but it just made the construction very challenging. Yes? Is the construction been there? Well, I think the Red Sox would say that, uh, that like, you know, any, no building ever really stops, right? No building, it, buildings are always changing, but there was such a huge focus over a 10 year period to do the major upgrades, and when the scoreboards were complete a couple of years ago, I think that really marked. Uh, for them, the end of a decade long, a focus on major projects at Fenway, uh, but I don't think a season goes by that you don't see some kind of investment in the park and something new there for fans just to keep it new and fresh. I think there's a question in the far Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see for the light of anyone up above about the <laughs> fifth row. We did. Um, we did look at that. Uh, the, um, the seats that you're referring to are those behind the columns uh, where the tread width is an average of 29 and 30 inches and today most new ballparks have, have 31 or 32 inches there. So it's not as much as, you know, it feels tight. It's not as much as you think it is. Uh, when we refurbished those seats, we did them to National Park Service standards and we were able to adjust them so that no seat is less than 19 inches wide, which is an industry standard. But because we were looking to renovate the park using the National Park Service guidelines, we didn't want to go too far uh, off of the grid and making changes. Um, so we accepted that as some of the quirks of Fenway. And uh, indeed, if you look at the price structure of the Red Sox tickets, I think they've been um, very sensitive to where the, the, the less great seats are. That's where your cheapest seats are. Unlike most ballparks where your cheap seats are upstairs, some of Fenway's best seats are upstairs because you've got so much space and room and you've got wider seats, deeper um, tread width. Uh, often you have uh, drink rails and bar stools um, on the, the upper decks. And so the areas you're referring to, while they may not be comfortable, it, they are a cheap seat and they're in the lower deck. So, I, you know, I'm, it's, no ballpark's ever perfect, and I think we accepted some of those quirks at Fenway and tried to deal with them with the uh, price point of the tickets. I can't see any other questions, so if there are none, I'll uh, just say thank you again for having me.